My friends, the situation for the Ukrainian army at Solidar seems to get worse every new hour. You are walking on a tightrope. The US has already sent more than 2,000 vehicles, including hundreds of mine resistant vehicles and Humvees. But because of Ukraine's collapsing front near Solidar. Another fuck up. Another fuck up. NATO has launched a swift response the delivery of French MX 10 light tanks. 40 German Mauders infantry fighting vehicles, and more importantly, 50 US-made M2 Bradleys. Hmm, what happened to all the hundreds and thousands of vehicles that Ukraine already had? Okay. Truth be told, the current situation seems so desperate that NATO is now pressing Germany to allow Leopard 2s to fight in Ukraine. And it's mission accomplished! After donating 230 T-72s, the Polish president announced that Poland will supply a company of 14 Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. Who would have thought that German tanks would once again fight on the steps of Ukraine? Meanwhile, the White House is already considering what to send after the Bradleys. Political Pentagon ways sending striker combat vehicles to Ukraine. The strikers are the newer, better armored version of the Bradleys, like a younger, harder sister type of thing. But the sugar daddy keeps on spoiling his little princess. NATO already sent 152 units of the M777 howitzers to Ukraine. Yet, it's not enough. Let's take a look at the last package that the United States sent. On top of everything I already told you, the US will send an extra 100 M113 armored personnel carriers, 55 mine resistant ambush protected vehicles, 138 Humvees, and here's the new kid on the block, 18 self propelled M109 Paladins, and 36 units of the 105mm M101 towed howitzers. Some Bradleys and Paladins were already spotted in the Netherlands and could enter Ukraine within the next few days. Plus infinite amount of ammunition. What cheat code are they using? No, I don't know. They said something like 100,000 rounds of ammo as if it's like peanuts. They call me Mr. Plenty. Yet, don't panic. Everything is under control. Welcome to History Legends. Here the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. Remember that if you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, just like with many other commentators, a lot of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to subscribe to my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Huge thanks to all of you that have already helped. And welcome to the headquarters. NATO to the rescue. So it's not the first time we speak of NATO sending armored vehicles to Ukraine. Here you can see a column of Dutch YPR 675 near Bahmut. And here's a train with perhaps 50 Turkish Fox 4 Kirpi armored personal carriers passing through Romania towards Ukraine. But, big but, is the first time we get the jolly news of modern NATO grade armored fighting vehicles being shipped to the front. Things are about to get spicy. Let's take a look at these vehicles and what they can bring to the battlefield. On the 4th of January, France promised to send some AMX-10RC light tanks to Ukraine. The AMX-10 is a highly mobile armored reconnaissance vehicle with six wheels, weighing 20 tons. But what makes it unique is its powerful turret-mounted 105mm gun. Surprisingly, the caliber of the AMX-10 is identical to the one of the Leopard 1. However, since the French vehicle shoots a different type of ammunition, it has less penetrating power. The AMX-10 has a crew of four and has been used as a reconnaissance vehicle and tank killer by French forces in the past. Its high maneuverability and speed would allow Ukrainian troops to hit hard and quickly pull back. And on top of speed, its main strength is firepower. Meanwhile, the main drawback is its relatively light armor. And the fact that the main gun only fires when the vehicle is stationary, since no stabilization system is fitted. In my opinion, that means that this French light tank will be difficult to use in offensive operations. It's almost bound to be used defensively in some sort of prepared ambush sites. Each AMX 10RC is loaded with 38 main gun rounds, 4,000 rounds of 7.62mm ammunition, and 16 smoke grenades. Now, thing is, we don't know how many units France will send to Ukraine. There are rumors circulating that there are already some units in Ukraine as we speak. But overall, analysts believe that the first package will be 10 AMX-10. 
and that the total amount that France could supply to Ukraine is about 100 units. Then comes the German Marda infantry fighting vehicle. Now in its article, Der Spiegel falsely claimed that for the first time, Western-style armored personnel carriers are now to be delivered to Ukraine. No, because Americans and their allies already donated a ton of M113 APCs. The fact that the Marda is an infantry fighting vehicle means that there's a crew of three men plus extra space for six grenadiers. So you need two Mardas to carry a full squad. And if we use basic math, the total transportation capacity of 40 Mardas would be 20 squads, or roughly 240 infantrymen. The Marda weighs more than 33 tons. But despite its weight, it is particularly flexible and versatile. No joke, its main strength is its reversing speed, which is actually extremely important when an infantry fighting vehicle wants to leave the battlefield. Meaning that one Marda could suppress enemy positions with its 20mm automatic cannon, destroy enemy BMPs with its Milan anti-tank gather weapons, disembark 6 infantrymen in front of a building, then quickly reverse to pick up another group, so on and so forth. To me it seems pretty solid, it's basically like a helicopter insertion with vehicles. So the actual transportation capacity is much more than 240 men. The Marder IV adapts to the terrain in which it is supposed to fight. It is renowned to be able to fight its way through difficult terrain through which others of its kind would not get through, like rivers, jungle, and rocky mountains, day or night as well as in all weather conditions. However, the main drawback was discovered during combat operations in Afghanistan, when the Bundeswehr discovered that the Marda did not provide the best protection against enemy fire. Shortly after being hit, the Marda would burn quickly, and effectively could be destroyed with a small amount of explosives, compared to other infantry fighting vehicles. But despite this problem, it still provides much more protection than an infantryman fighting in open terrain on his own. The good news for Ukraine is that the Marda IFV is being phased out of the Bundeswehr. Currently, there's still about 370 units in storage, and a lot of them could be sent to Ukraine. The recurrent problem with the Bundeswehr is that they're not operational. The director of Rheinmetall, Armin Papperga, announced that all the Mardas would have to be repaired first. And regarding that topic, the Germans claim that their vehicle can be repaired easily and quickly. But this is when there's a little star at the bottom with font 3 saying that these vehicles have to be repaired in Germany or Poland. Germany could also send older models, but the cannon of those is not stabilized. So during a shaky ride, the Marder will hardly be able to target enemy positions. Let's just hope that Ukraine doesn't get the vintage version. As of now, Germany has 20 Marders ready for delivery by April and another 50 by September, with a total supply available for Ukraine estimated at 100 to 120 units. Now enters the Chad, the M2A2 Bradley, common plus one if your name is Brad. In reality, the Marder or the Bradley differ little in size, weight, or engine power. The biggest difference is regarding the firepower. The Bradley has a 25mm chain gun that allows special armor-piercing ammunition to be fired. Due to the depleted uranium in each round, the projectiles have an increased penetrating power, which can even be fatal for Soviet-era tanks. The M2 Bradley proved itself during the Iraq War of 2003. Armed with two tow anti-tank missile launchers, it could easily destroy Iraqi BMPs at a distance of over 800 meters. As a matter of fact, more Iraqi tanks were destroyed by Bradleys than by Abrams tanks. The modernized M2A2 version can carry seven passengers on top of its three crew, compared to the M113 APC that has a crew of two, but that can carry up to 15 soldiers. But as you can see, it's not covered on top and it has relatively light armor, but it can still achieve a fine job. Here you can see an M113 model AS4 armored personal carrier in the service of the Ukrainian 66 mechanized brigade. What you gain in protection, you lose in space. With that being said, always use protection, boys. Even if you prefer to let it breathe the fresh air. If 50 M113s could disembark 750 men at once, 50 Bradleys can only transport 350 infantrymen. If we take a look at the organization and structure of a US Army mechanized platoon, we see that it consists of 40 men and 4 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, meaning that with the latest American donation, they can transport 12 platoons at once. 
But again, it's not entirely true because these vehicles can do a lot of back and forth. The most important advantage of the armed forces of Ukraine is that, unlike the French and German vehicles, which can be delivered to Ukraine with a maximum of 100 units each over the span of several months after repairs, the United States has more than 2,000 M2 Bradleys in storage. The United States can easily send several hundred of them to Ukraine in 2023 alone. We should replace the Let's Go Brandon by Let's Go Bradley. We can also quickly talk about the 18 self-propelled 155mm Paladin howitzers sent to Ukraine. It's the first time that the United States donated these to Ukraine. However, other countries have already supplied the M109 Paladin, like Latvia that donated 6 units, Norway with 23, and the UK 20 units. Interestingly enough, if we take a look at an American Armored Brigade combat team, we see that they're composed of 87 Abrams, 152 Bradley's IFVs, 18 Paladins, and 45 M113s. So apart from the Abrams, Ukraine can certainly form at least one of such units. They have the Bradley's, they can add in some of the Milders, they have the Paladins, and now they have a lot of the M113. And essentially, instead of having the firepower of the Abrams, they'll have hundreds and hundreds of armored vehicles like the Kerpi for improved mobility and speed, which we saw can be decisive for Blitzkrieg tactics. Or they can form an actual armored brigade using Poland's brand new Leopard 2s. Before we talk about Ukraine's offensive plans for spring 2023, a quick word from our sponsor. A war like this one has a ripple effect on the entire world. Along with oil prices, some of the most popular food products are more expensive due to inflation. Milk, eggs, butter, and cheese. Their prices have surged over 20% in a few months. It would be one thing if these were the only problems we had to worry about. But most experts believe things are gonna get worse. A few years ago, you may have relied on savings and investments to stop the bleeding. But the traditional 60-40 stock bond portfolio is down 34% last year. So where can the average person go in chaotic times like this? Historically, physical assets like real estate and gold have withstood inflation and economic downturns. But rising mortgage rates have sent the housing market into a spiral. And gold is more stable, yet may not be showing much price appreciation as of late. Lucky for us, there's another option that could help us protect from more losses. A historically valuable alternative asset with a near zero correlation to stocks and bonds. It's fine art. With our sponsor, Masterworks, you can invest in museum-grade contemporary art for a fraction of the cost. I know what you're thinking. It's not digital art. It's not an overpriced, blinged-out JPEG. These pieces are the real deal. You might not realize this, but over the last 26 years, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 by 131%, with almost every market taking on huge losses this year. And inflation still at historic levels. Investors need some more growth potential. And since my first video on Masterworks back in November, they've sold three paintings. Those three sales handed back 10.4, 13.9, and 35% net returns to their investors. That brings Masterworks to over $25 million return to their investors last year, even during record turmoil. Over 550,000 members have signed up so far, and offerings have sold out in a matter of minutes. But my subscribers get priority access by using the link in the description below. Battle plans. As we saw, the new NATO vehicles will be combat ready by spring 2023, and most likely meant for offensive operations. Ukraine's strategy is simple. Gain time in Bahmut, Salidar, hold the line and perhaps retreat to a secondary line if necessary. Meanwhile, they'll prepare a modern army at the rear for a big counteroffensive in spring 2023. Basically a repeat of what they did in September 2022. When I went MIA for a month, Ukraine pulled back a lot of units from the front line for this purpose. For example, here, soldiers of the Ukrainian 93rd Mechanized Brigade practicing a mechanized assault somewhere in the rear. Or here, new recruits of the Ukrainian 1st Mechanized Battalion, part of the 67th Mechanized Brigade, swearing allegiance to the Ukrainian people. On top of that, a new Azov unit has been formed, namely the 3rd Assault Brigade Azov. But the big news is that a couple days ago, Rybar released this map 
showing how Ukraine is actually forming two brand new army corps at the rear, one in Dnipro and one in Poltava. These two formations are said to be using the latest American battlefield command and control systems. It's basically a NATO corps with Ukrainian soldiers. Oh, oh. Overall, we can count eight brigades being refitted and training with all the new toys from the West. Obviously, as you can imagine, there is very little information. However, there are some bits and pieces that we can put together. All we know is that some disbanded units will join the newly established 10th Army Corps in the Dnipro region and will receive the most recent Western weapons and equipment. Some will be restaffed with mobilized personnel and sent back to the front line in regular brigades. And here's the important information. Apparently, most of the units that were withdrawn came from the Saledar area, which could explain the latest developments there. Further north in Poltava, four new brigades are being formed. The 116th, the 117th, the 118th Brigades, as well as the 34th Marines Regiment, supported by the 229th Logistics Battalion. And rumors say that the convoy of Turkish Kirpi armored personnel carriers that I showed you earlier will be handed over to the Marines of the 34th Brigade. One option for this brand new Army Corps would be used in elastic defense, somewhere in Donbass to stall Russian attacks. Whenever the Russians push somewhere, these troops will be ready to counterattack immediately. Or they can even go on the offensive and reconquer Saledar. Oh, but I don't think this is the option that the Ukrainian general staff will use. Ukraine wants to reconquer its lost territory and has explicitly said they want Crimea. And because of that, a Ukrainian offensive is highly expected by Surovikin. The only problem is that Ukraine wants to recreate the offensive they launched in September 2022, but now, Russia has four times more men on the front. Even worse, the fact that the Russian army has extensively reduced its front line and that they haven't opened a new front means that Ukraine can only attack in two places. One option could be a renewed offensive against Luhansk Oblast in the direction of Svatove and Kremina, which would be used to flank and encircle the cities of Severodonetsk and Izichansk. Another option would be the much-talked-about offensive against Melitopol, whose goal would be to reach the Azov Sea and cut off, flank the Russian defenses along the Dnieper, and push towards Crimea. Knowing the Ukraine command and their Soviet heritage, they'll probably do both, and launch all the reserves in the direction that works the best. And to be honest, from a Ukraine perspective, that's really all they can do. They don't have much more options. Thing is, in Luhansk, all the way behind Svatove, the Russians have built an impressive network of anti-tank defenses and firing positions in case of a Ukraine breakthrough. As for an offensive towards Crimea, reports indicate that the Russians have positioned a lot of reserves west of Melitopol, as if they were expecting a Ukrainian breakthrough and ready to flank them once the Ukrainians are overextended. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description.